So I've had a, a traditional cash-based practice now. I'm going on my 11th year. So I never did take insurance other than in residency and when I worked in the ER, and I opted out of Medicare about, I think, five years ago now. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is for those of you who want to get out of the current system and do a cash-based practice. And this right here is why I don't want to be an insurance doctor, okay? <laughs> this is how I see it. <laughs> So really, I think by taking cash, it's actually a big opportunity. It's not just to escape, it's actually an opportunity. Okay, so why I did it in the first place. For one, when I was in residency, I always felt like I didn't have enough time with each patient. I felt like everything was on a ticking time clock. When I would moonlight, we had seven minutes to see a patient, then it went down to five, then it went down to four, and the shorter you can see the patient, the more you would get in bonuses or, or special accolades, and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. It made me very stressed out. I always felt like I was missing something. Then I would stay like five hours later doing all the paperwork. So um, now doctors spend as much time doing paperwork as they do seeing patients. And this was a 2010 study, and I'll bet it's going to be even worse in the next two years. I felt like I was, again, getting decreasing pay for increasing work because I was still spending a lot of time. And in the meantime, Medicare was decreasing their rates. Now the insurance companies are decreasing their rates to keep up with Medicare, so that was a never-ending thing, and I didn't see that there was a bottom to that. And I didn't want to, the government to decide if I was a good doctor or not, or if I should be paid. <laughs> I also had a big fear of losing my livelihood if I made an honest mistake. I felt like I was always fudging the truth to get the right ICD-9 codes. I was trying to make the diagnosis fit the code I needed to get reimbursed properly or to get the test that the patient needed. And I wanted to be able to see patients for free. Right now, if you take Medicare, it's against the law to see patients for free. And I don't, I don't want to do that, and I've never wanted to do that. I also wanted to, um, didn't want to have to live by the, all the other paperwork, the fines, the fees, and all the government regulations. So here's one of the things that has always scared me, and this is the Medicare fraud. I'm certain there is some Medicare fraud out there, but we see over and over doctors who get thrown in prison for making mistakes. And I don't want to be one of those, and I don't think any doctor should have to be one of those. And this is a great way for the government to make money, is to go and try to find these doctors who make mistakes. Okay, once I opted out of um, Medicare, what improved immediately was I didn't have to have as much staff. I don't have to have people to get prior authorization. I don't have to submit and resubmit claims. I don't have to worry about coding. That's huge. That's one or two people probably in your practice that you don't need. I have no accounts receivable. At the end of the day, whatever's left in the cash drawer, that's how much I take home. And my, my, my time is spent with the patient, not on paperwork, not fighting with insurance companies, not spending time away from patient care. I think a lot of the problem with this is that doctors are in the dark about this. They teach us in med school not to talk about money. They don't give us any business education at all. If doctors talk about money, it's con they're bad doctors or mean doctors. And we don't even know what other doctors make, and we're not supposed to ask for money. And we can't even legally compare charges. And in residency, all we're taught to do is code. They never tell you how much you should get paid. So the market right now, and this is probably going to change quickly, but 49.9 million Americans don't have health insurance. Um, However, patients rate their loyalties to their country, their family, and their doctor. So we're in the top three, and we need to keep that in mind. That's a very important place to be, and we want to stay there. The average wait to see a family physician right now is 20 days. There's one of those niches we were talking about. If you can get in there and make your wait less, make same-day appointments, that's huge. And 27% of the uninsured actually have incomes above 50000 And in my practice, that's probably about 75% of my practice. 
Okay, this is not medicine. I don't even know what this stuff is, actually. And I'm glad I don't know what this is. I'm glad I don't have to worry about these codes and these numbers and how to get paid. So I just started from scratch. So when I very first started, I worked at an ER. I got a feel for the locations, the nurses, the specialists, and the patients, and they got to know me. Um, I rented a little um, section of a building from a well-established doctor who was too busy, and that really helped a lot too. I started very small. I started actually by having probably 10 tongue depressors, one otoscope. I started very small, and as the money came in, I bought another otoscope. And as that came in, I'm, one of the patients I traded, she made the gowns for the office. I mean, little things like that, and I just didn't spend money I didn't have. I didn't have an interior decorator, I didn't have anything fancy, but it was fine because the area I'm in is like that. In Marble Falls, people understood that and actually appreciate that. So here's kind of how I started. I just made it extremely simple, keeping with the KISS theory. I decided how much I wanted to, base, to make based on other physicians in the field. Okay, I'm internal medicine and pediatrics, so I based it, kind of took a comparison between those two. Double that amount for your overhead, and then just divide it out. Um, this was kind of for the med students, but this divide it out on how many days a week you want to work, how many hours a day you want to work. That's how much we charge per patient. So here's some more math stuff. If you want this later, I'll show you. But again, this is fairly simple. So <coughs> you know if you want to make 250000 it comes out, if you want to work four days a week for eight hours a day, it comes out to $125 a patient. And again, that doesn't necessarily have to be how much you charge the patient. You could charge the patient, say, 100 and on average do one or two lab tests that are $25, add up to $25 as your take home. So, I just kept it very, very simple, and it's always worked for me. As a matter of fact, the only thing I've had to do is raise my prices because I'm too busy. I also try to make everything very efficient. Um, I have an EMR that's um, called Amazing Charts that was very cheap. I, I think it's still only $2,000, and if you do take insurance, it goes with all those regulation things. <laughs> so, sorry. But um, it's very low priced. You can put your own. Um, templates in it and it's worked very well for me. Finding staff, I found young, enthusiastic people from the ER and from the community that I knew would grow with me. Right now, I'll see kids eight or nine and I'll tell them, you're gonna come work here when you're a little older. And they do, <laughs> so <laughs> they do. This last three months, I've had a PA student work with me and he uh, taught my kids to swim 10 years ago. So it really does work that way. Um, I hired a very experienced office manager on the other hand, although she did tell me when I started, there's no way this is gonna work. <laughs> okay, but it did. Um, I use Craigslist for a lot of my um, supplies and things like that. I bought used equipment and then I upgraded um, as I made more money. I started small, like I said, I didn't take out a loan, I didn't buy a building, I didn't, I painted, <laughs> but that's about it. So. I would advise start small, pay yourself first, then put it in, back into your business. I negotiated, you can negotiate a lot of things. You can negotiate x-ray prices for your patients. You can negotiate lab, lab prices you can negotiate like you wouldn't believe. And this can save you and your patients a lot of money, especially if you have competing laboratories. I mean, we even negotiate our strep test and we'll switch them out every few months if it's cheaper. Building a practice. Um, this is very important if you make the switch over. It's going to be even more important, I think, than if you start from scratch, maybe. Um, local news stories, whatever was up, the flu, um, any pandemics, rabies in our area, things like that, that really got my business going because people would read these stories in the news and come in. Um, if you advertise with the newspapers, they'll also do a story on you. So when I first started, I said, I'm going to make house calls. I'm going to be this little small town doctor. And the news loved it. They wouldn't do a story unless I bought an ad, though. So OK, bought an ad. I don't think people came in from the ad, but people came in from the story. Um, don't be afraid to promote yourself. When I'm in the grocery store and somebody sneezes, I tell them I know a good doctor. <laughs> so, <laughs> too. Um, 
I act like a celebrity. Make yourself known. Look at the politicians. Look what they do. Do the same sort of thing. When you're at church, at a restaurant, in the grocery store. Know your personality type and the things you like to do and expand on that. If you don't like it, charge more. If you hate it, don't do it. I hate abscess INDs. I charge a ton for them. And so then if I do them, I kind of like them. So. <laughs> The things that didn't help much were newspaper ads. I tried to do a radio talk show. For me, it didn't work. It might work for people with, who are more charismatic on the radio. Um, the local medical societies, that didn't help particularly to me. Those people were already inundated. The hospital charities, they have their own agenda. And gimmicks like flu shot coupons, I got one person came in for that, okay? But doing other things did, like we went and did flu shots at um, one of the local businesses. So we gave flu shots to everybody who works in the quarry. That did, those people liked us and wanted to come back. Any way you can get where people know you and know your personality type, so if they're that way, they'll come to you, that's what I would highly recommend. We went to Home Depot and gave flu shots one year. We um, one year did blood pressure screenings at some of the local uh, restaurants. All that sort of thing is good and it's fun. What helped me the most were my kids because my kids were in a lot of activities. Word of mouth is my entire practice is based on word of mouth. I actually have an advertising degree and did that before medicine and I never got to use it except for that flu shot coupon. <laughs> so my patients have done all my advertising for me. The other thing that helps immensely is um, the VIP service. All of our patients are VIPs. When we started, we had to fake it. We had to write little notes in the chart about what their dog's names were or who their great-grandfather was, but now we know all of that. So all our patients really are VIPs, and they know that, and they know that they're special, and they know if they're really sick, they can get in, and they know if they're really, really sick, we'll go to their house. And they're not going to go anywhere else. Even if they have great insurance, they're not going to go anywhere else if you're going to be there when they take their dying breath. If you're going to be there when the going gets tough, they're going to come to you. And other doctors actually send me a lot of patients because I can spend a lot more time with the patients. So am I a better doctor? Am I a smarter doctor? No, but I can spend more time with them so it makes me a better doctor and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't have kids, I would recommend, though, getting in the Rotary Club, the Kiwanis Club, any of those kind of things, too, so people can know who you are. Or go speak at those things if you don't want to join them. But they're always looking for interesting speakers, and that's another thing, way to get involved and get more patients. Also, when we talk about that niche, again, unique services, like house calls, greater access. My, my patients all have um, my cell phone and they can reach me 24 seven. I've only had one patient in 11 years abuse it. So everybody else, when they call, the first thing they say is, I'm sorry for calling you, but. So I love those patients. Um, upfront pricing, a lot of patients, especially cash patients, don't know how much things cost. A lot of the people who work at doctor's offices don't know how much things cost. My daughter just had an EGD, and the amount it cost us was three times the amount we were told it was going to cost. People don't know. They didn't do it on purpose, just nobody knows. Um, better lab prices, we do significantly better lab prices, so other doctors will send patients to us who have cash, who have very high deductible plans, because <clears throat> at our local hospital, which is a charity hospital, it cost <laughs> it costs $150 to get a CBC. At our office, it costs $15 to get a CBC. Um, and a very attentive staff, this is very important. You're only as good as your staff is, so make sure you get a good staff. Whatever that takes, get a good staff. If that means being nice to them, if that means paying them more, if that means fire, hiring and firing over and over, whatever it means, but get a good staff. And then we, do, we can do comprehensive workups as the other unique service I offer because I can offer people who have Medicare a workup that they can't necessarily get or won't get with their Medicare doctors. Um, here's something that we do to make our practice unique. Um, this is one of our um, little kids from Haiti. So in order for them to bring them over, they had to have a doctor say that they would take care of them. So this is one of them. But we give teachers and preachers a discount. Um, we do uh, free visits if you're one of our patients who gets cancer. We do $5 off if you come in wearing spurs, which is kind of hokey, but I don't care. <laughs> so, 
we make house calls and um, we see missionaries and rescued kids for free, which we'll probably have to change the missionary thing because we have too many missionaries. But just still, what a great, great patient population, right? Crowns in heaven. So every patient is a VIP. We stay late if they get really sick. Everyone can call me at home. We don't do any price gouging like we talked about. Um, yeah, and the CBC's actually gone up. That was 79, now it's 150. Um, and we work very hard for customer service. Every patient is a customer, and we keep that in mind. So if you've been working for a place where you don't like your patients, you gotta change that. You have to change the mindset, and remember, they're your bread and butter, and then they will become worth it, I promise. So my fastest growing segment right now, this is my oldest patient. He actually was in the second um, storm on the beaches of Normandy. So, um, but my fastest growing patient population are Medicare patients. So how do you think that guy got to be that old, huh? No. <laughs> Um, we have patients that feel like they can't get answers from their insurance doctors. And again, I built this reputation based on that because I can spend more time with them. I see a lot of Mexican nationals, so I think if Obamacare makes me ever take insurance, that's, that's probably going to be 100% of my patient population. But um, those are actually great patients for me here in Texas and Austin. Those are my favorite patients. They always pay, they always pay cash, and they respect you in a way that that a lot of patients that are used to having insurance doctors don't. I love that patient population. Um, and then we also have a little area at the end of the day that we always save for people who need same day appointments, which means sometimes I leave at 5.30, sometimes I leave at 8.30, but I'm okay with that. Because the harder you work, the more you get paid. So you get an immediate payoff too. Now getting out of Medicare, I'm just gonna skim through because everybody's kind of talked about it, but be sure you send the opt-out affidavit to your local carrier. You have to renew it every two years. We sent a letter to our Medicare patients explaining why we were doing what we were doing, and we set up a meeting with those patients. And I had some of my favorite patients come to, the ones I knew would stay there, my big fans, and I explained to, I had them explain to the rest of the patients how I went to their house when their wife was dying of liver cancer, things like that, so the other patients would understand the value and worth of me. Those are my parents, so be very careful. They're in there to show you they're looking over their contract. You have to have everybody do an opt-out. So you have to make sure, like even my parents, if I wanna call them in an antibiotic on the weekend and my mom has a positive strep test, I have to make sure that I have a contract with her, even though I don't charge her. Um, and the AAPS website can help you a lot with that. We did the same thing Adam talked about and had a script and I would call on my day off and quiz my staff. Hello, I need an appointment. <laughs> so. so it is kind of scary, I will say. It's very, it literally feels like jumping off a cliff and you hope that you don't fall. But it does work. And the reason it works is because people get to choose. People get to choose where their health care dollars go. I see billionaires. I have two billionaires in my practice. And I see migrant workers. And everybody gets good care and good treatment. There's not an outside organization that stands to profit more if I do less. And my incentive is to take care of the person who pays the bill. The benefits are I have a lot more time to spend with a patient, lower overhead, a lot more flexibility. If my daughter has a big gymnastics meet, I can take off. If I have an AAPS meeting, I can take off. I don't have to trade around or feel guilty about it. I have better compensation for the time I spend. I have empowered patients who feel like they're a part of the medical process, and I have a true doctor-patient relationship. I don't have all that regulation, and like Adam says, I have a lot more time with my family, which I really like. Real quick, I was going to talk about, here's the other nightmare that's coming for you, and another reason the ICD-9 to 10 codes are going from 3,000 to 87,000 codes, over 140,000 possible codes. I don't know about you all, but if I ever do have to use a code, which sometimes I rarely do, I cannot figure out which one it is, so this is gonna be an even bigger nightmare. Okay, here's some examples. There's, these are the modern codes which are supposed to help our healthcare system. There's one for struck by turtle initial encounter, struck by turtle subsequent encounter, and struck by turtle sequelae. <laughs> really? 
There is an ICD-10 ICD code for drowning and submersion due to falling or jumping from burning water skis. There's also one for burn, yes there is. There's also one for a burn due to water skis on fire. I did a big internet search and I could find a lot of things as you'll see in a minute, but I could not find one single case of anyone who was ever burned on water skis. <laughs> but there's a code. Um, Oh, and all these codes, where they're going, and pretty soon they're going to have ICD-11 codes, and then we're all going to have to do it. I'm trying to get out right now. So they have to be specific enough to be meaningful is what they say. So, okay, so I even found this. Other contact with dolphin. <laughs> There's a code for that. <laughs> so. So the payoff is I love going to work every single day. There's not a single day I don't like going to work. I get to make house calls. I get to hold people's hands as they go into the great blue yonder. I get to be there to love on their family, and I love it. The patients really do see me as family. I have a patient who just named their last baby Juliet. Oh. Of course, it's their 10th baby, so they might have run out of names, <laughs> but her name is Juliet. <laughs> so. And I get treated like doctors did in the old days. People bring me pies and cakes and, and invite me to the funerals and invite me to the weddings and the graduations, and they mean it. And I don't think there's another doctor's office that has as many people say, I love you. I have so many patients every day who say, I love you, and they mean it. This, this is a phenomenon I've just seen in the, like the past two or three years, and it's really been amazing. It actually kind of gives me chills how many people do it, and it's, that is so rewarding to me. So keep the doctor-patient relationship pure. This is a very sacred relationship, and we're in such a good position here. But keep it sacred. Keep it pure. Make those patients up close to you. Don't let anything get between those, that relationship. Don't let the government get in there. Don't get, let the insurance companies get in there. Keep it just you and the patient. We have the best health care options in the world right now and the best doctors in the world and we need to fight to keep it that way. And just remember why you went to med school. Like he was talking about earlier, remember that zeal and excitement and wanting to be a doctor and put that back in your practice. There's my family. Thank you.